Thank you, Stu, for the uh, introduction. Uh, really, very short. I just wanted to uh, welcome you to this uh, nice presentation by Constantinus and also the uh, uh, demo after that in the lab. So this is the third or fourth year that we're doing it with mm -hmm. this Surf IP and, uh, you know, Mark was our um, previous student and uh, before that was Jason and now David. So uh, I think it has been a very uh, good experience for the um, students, for our, you know, uh, graduate students and postdocs, they can work together. And also for us, very exciting. Uh, and usually we continue that. It doesn't stop during summer. We kind of continue during fall and uh, winter. After that, actually, the, the last two just stayed with us till graduation. Uh, so which is, you know, uh, good. Anyway, uh, with that short introduction, um, uh, Constantinus will tell you about uh, the details of the project. So, hello from me. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction, of both of you. Uh, so, some time ago, uh, they told me, they asked me to give a presentation to you. So, I was really, really excited. Why? Because I knew that here you're going to be some of the most brilliant and bright UCI students. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, what I expect from you is to really give me hard time, right? <laughs> and I promise that I will try to give you some hard time also, right? So <laughs> it will not be a typical presentation. I would like to have your contribution. Why? Because we're going to talk about telecoms. So this is something that you already know. And probably some of them, you know some of the details better than me. This is something that you use, you play with, that you need every day. It's not very exotic, right? So. I will try in my today's presentation to show you that flex flexible wireless systems, software defined radio, mobile ad hoc network <coughs> is something that you already use, you already play with, and practically you know all the concepts behind. Mm -hmm. So, after the presentation, I will be very glad if you would be able to understand a bit more about telecoms and then know what are uh, what the challenges and the trade-offs are. So I hope that when you see now your smart device after the presentation, you will know exactly what you know big companies should do for next generation devices and what the problems are. So <coughs> this is the agenda, but I don't want to say a lot of things about that, but go directly to future wireless communication systems. And here I want to ask you something. You use wireless communications, right? What is the, th the thing that really says if a wireless technology is really successful or not? What is the driving force? What do you believe that it is? We discuss about telecoms. You use telecoms, so you should know, right? Any idea? I promised him to hear students speak up a lot. So. <laughs> Come on, give me some hard time. <laughs> Interesting, but for me, as a person, it's loudly perception. Uh, loudly perception, of course. But what's, what is the one I'm asking? Yeah, I understand that this is a need that all the users have, right? This is true. But what is the thing that says that if a technology is really successful or not? For example, some years ago, we were discussing a lot about 3G, and a lot of companies spent money on 3G. But 3G technology at that time failed. Now, they come with 3G. Everyone wants 3G, and now we go to 4G. Why? Sorry? Bit rates. I think that it's all about applications, mm. right? So the issue is that when we go to telecoms, we should know that there is an application that really we need, right? And of course, we're willing to pay for that. So we started with just having, you know, uh, just talking and texting for wireless communications. It was okay, right? No one was willing to pay more in order to have something more. Then we had the internet, had the different applications, then we had our laptops. So now we, we want to increase throughput. Whoa, okay, now the problem starts coming. 
And then we would like to have all those in a little small device that we could have everywhere. Oh God. And what kind of applications are we going to have? Okay, you know these applications, right? Mm -hmm. Future mobile trials, information, and the pavement, and everything. Challenging mobile application classes. So, what is the difficult thing with these applications? Can you say something? Which is really difficult and really difficult to handle? <coughs> they are all heterogeneous and they want different things. Communication. I don't care very much about you know the performance that I'm going to have, but I need to have it real time, right? I need to have it real time. Mm -hmm. The same with entertainment. You know, when I play, you know, from the internet, I don't want to have delays. But with information, I don't have such kind of problems. So different applications, different traders. Okay, I understand that. But this is one part of the game. What is the other part? <coughs> What do we expect from future wireless communications? Oh, this application, it's the easy part. We need devices that think. Oh God, why my device should think? That's crazy, right? But why? Before trying to explain <coughs> why, I will just try to ask you a couple of things about basic communications in order to have a common understanding. When we, have, when we try to transmit in a wireless way, what is the first problem that we have to confront with? <coughs> Any ideas? Signal. Hmm? Signal. signal. Yes, we transmit the signal, right? Noise. Noise. This is one very good parameter. Yes, this is noise, the one thing. There is still, there is something more significant than noise. Any ideas? Multiple effects. Do you know what is it? I'll try to describe it. So in wireless communications, we would like to send a path, a signal, let's say, right? We send the energy, but we are full of re reflectors, right? One part of the energy we reach this time, or as we want. Some of these, and maybe another thing, may be reflected. So the end of the energy should go like that. So we send something which is higher, and we receive something like that, right? So all the energy doesn't come at the same time. And due to reflections, it comes distorted, right? But still, here's the, it's not the whole problem. The problem is that when we want to have high throughput, right, we need a lot of information to send in a time. Then all of these comes close to each other. And then all of these destroy each other. This is called intersimple interference. So when <coughs> we would like to go to higher speeds, unfortunately, due to the environment, our signal is destroyed. So this is multiple. Are you familiar with the Fourier transform? Here? Sure. I will try to explain you the relationship between, you know that we need spectrum, right? But what's the, uh, the relationship of throughput and spectrum? Can you describe it? Relationship between what? Throughput. Between throughput, uh -huh. meaning that, you know, the speed, the gap per sec, <coughs> and uh, um, the, the uh, frequency that we need, the spectrum. What's the relationship, you know? Practically, they are inverse. So, which means that <coughs> if we have this go like that, then we need, let's say, some spectrum, some frequency that is. If it is double this, then the frequency double. What is the problem with that? that when we send information and we don't want, you know, this is the information here, then we go to some other <coughs> frequency, but we don't want the spectrums to cover each other, right? So this is, in simple words, the multiple problem. So what we want from cognitive wireless networks and radio? Here is a about resources, right? Have you ever heard that 
we have a lot of frequency holes, so there is allocated frequency that is not used, so people should be able to go and use. So, we need to identify where is the interference, multipath and noise, as you already said, right? And the device should, should be able to find where they should go and work. And the, the problem is that all these change in time, right? The out channel, unfortunately, is not static, it's dynamic. Even if some kind of reflector moves, then it affects a corresponding equivalent multipath channel. So we have another problem there. So another thing is that we would like to uh, be able to analyze the situation and find the optimal communication protocol, frequency band, transmission mm -hmm. model, etc. Mm -hmm. Does it sound complicated to you? No. <laughs> I can make it even more complicated. <laughs> <laughs> Please tell me what is optimal. Nice. Optimal for anyone is translated in a different way. So we should be able for any kind of optimization problem to be able to solve it. We need to make trade-offs. Impossible. Is it complex enough? I can make it a bit more complex and configure. And how are we going to do that? <coughs> we have to take into account Moore's law. So it's the technology, right? How fast we can go with the technology. Machine learning and advanced optimization, right? The devices should be able to learn. And then we have to use communication information theory in order to make decisions. That's it. So this is what we expect from the future telecom systems. And I will show you that some of those have been already implemented. But I told you about devices that think. We have to do all those. Can you understand that we need one main attribute for wireless systems, which is flexibility, right? We need flexible system. But before about flexible systems, because in a while I will give you some time to think what is flexible, right? I didn't tell you what is optimal, but you will tell me what is flexible. I will try to, to show you this graph. I like this graph because it's terrible. <laughs> Doesn't make sense when you say that. <laughs> so you need at, at least, I need five minutes to understand what happens here. You need two because you are the most brilliant guys, right? <laughs> <laughs> so it's an old one, of course, but it talks about reality. So this is giga operations per second. So this is what our technology can do per second. How many calculations? And this is that, this line. The average for different technologies. This is megabit per second. This is a throughput that a, com a communication system wants, right? And this <coughs> is this line. And this is the performance per area. When we design a chip, what we can chip within the same area, right? We stream technology and code like that. So what's the main result that you can see here? <laughs> what are the bad news <laughs> included in here? That we need more complexity than uh, you know, the throughput to, to increase the same throughput. Meaning that if we need to increase the throughput two times, we need much more complexity than two times in order to achieve that. Oh, that. And here I have some very bad news that they don't include here. This line cannot go that way anymore. So here you can see that uh, the applications you know, at the same time increase with time. It cannot. Because why? Do you know why? Up now we're shrinking the chips, right? You know that. So you were buying uh, PCs that they had smaller processors and could do more things. Not anymore. Why? Because we have reached the limits of our technology. At 65 nanometers, then we have <coughs> problems with the physics inside the chip, which that's why now people and companies use multiprocessors. So, and a lot of problems. Radio flexibility. I gave you the time. Now you should tell me what is radio flexibility? <laughs> What's the st system flexibility? <coughs> okay, tell me about any kind of flexibility you want. <laughs> Not you, you know that. <laughs> <laughs> Another guy. David knows all this stuff. So. so, who will tell me? Okay. 
it was just like being able to adapt to different situations. Adapt. Hmm. It is flexible. Any other kind of flexibility? If something is able to be reconfigured, is it flexible? Yeah. Okay. If something is able to be dynamic, you know, to change on the fly when it recognizes the environment, is it flexible? So flexibility is not one thing, right? Flexibility is an umbrella term, which includes adaptivity. What is adaptivity? Can you really define adaptivity? Changing. Changing? For like a good reason, or like for the better. Okay. This is another thing. So you are the tomorrow scientists and engineers, right? right? Definitions are very important. If we don't know what the definitions mean, then we cannot discuss, right? Adaptivity, if we would like to define it somehow, is the ability to change in a system a numerical value depending on changing stress in the environment, right? Adaptive is adaptive filter, for example. They change a numerical value, right? But they don't change anything because the configurability is a structural change. Agreed? Another thing would be dynamic adjustment. Dynamic adjustment may be adaptive, may be reconfigurable, but we may just change the frequency values, right? It's not necessarily some of those, or any of those, or all of those. Component reusability. Agreed? And scalability. These are the, the main things that you can find in the literature that people uh, use in order to describe flexible variables. And now, you said about that, but why we need to be flexible? You should be able to reply now. Why? Tell me a good reason. One. Sure. And I will ask for a second. <laughs> Starting with one. More applications. Rather? More applications. More applications, right? We can support more applications. This is true, right? Mm -hmm. We can support only also what? More standards, right? In your device, in, in your laptop, okay, you need to have okay the, uh, the wireless access, but you also need Bluetooth, you need other things, right? What else? Multi-system operation. This is something that already said. Future proofness. So, you take your device, you have something inside that, and it's upgradable, right? right? So, this is what you're using. You have your uh, laptop, but still you can upgrade, upgrade it anytime. Okay, but well, not all the times. So we we'll discuss about that. Reduction of engineering costs, right? Dynamic spectrum access, I told you this is significant. Uh -huh. And here will come the combination of the optimized performance as a function of the operational scenario and the user needs. And now we haven't defined what are the user needs. So this comes again to applications. This comes about trade off, this comes about cognition. So we need flexibility. Are you convinced that we need flexibility? Yeah. I hope, yes. And of course, other things. So, software defined radio. David already described to you what a software defined radio is. Can you say in single words? What is it? <laughs> David, no one goes taking care of it. Go stage attention. <laughs> we should improve the presentation next time, right? <laughs> Make them write a test next time afterwards. So, a radio communication system in which we take some of the dedicated hardware and we implement it in hardware, in the software, right? So, the idea is that in the communication system, we have different components. Most of the time, they're ASICs, they're chips, you know, that they do a specific work. But they're not flexible at all, right? What we can do with software defined radio, instead of having that, we use general processing, <coughs> general processing device, and we run some software on them, right? And the question is, does it provide flexibility or not? Product life cycle. So you have 
your hardware and you can just update the software, right? <coughs> it's portable across hardware platforms. So you have your hardware, your PC, your, uh, you know, your smart device, everything, and you just need to change the software, right? And if it is open software, it's even sometimes cheaper. So what we should do? Use increasingly general pressure computing engines and increase the software content. Agree? Agree? Yes. That's wrong. Tell me why. Can you imagine why? I will ask you something from your everyday life. You have smart devices. Why they don't they have huge processors inside? Easy to respond, right? Yeah. Why? You can imagine, but right? state it. <coughs> Why? I don't want to carry it around. <laughs> yeah. They don't need them. They yeah. don't have to do with many tasks. Yeah. All the reasons that we said, which are all correct, are captured in this figure. So these are different technologies in order to make operations. This is chips, <coughs> dedicated chips. They don't have any flexibility at all, right? This is the chip design. And these are the general processors. Here we have the efficiency in terms of throughput, how many operations we can do per second, and this is the energy efficiency. So, general processor to ASIC have a difference of nearly four orders of magnitude. So, when you use a general processor, you spend four times more, four, sorry, four orders of magnitude more energy, and this is four orders of magnitude slower. <laughs> Good news. So we're going to do it, right? So we need to restrict somehow this. <coughs> so this is not flexible at all, and this is very flexible. Hmm. Here's the problem. So there is a trade-off. And here, I tell you, in the middle, is something that we call FPGAs, right? Which have some flexibility, feed programming gig arrays, but they're not that flexible, they cannot do anything, right? But still, they're somewhere in the middle. So, what's the problem? There is a trade-off between flexibility, energy efficiency, and throughput. So, we need to restrict flexibility to the maximum that we want, right? And here, it's a very difficult design. <coughs> and now, let's go to math. What are those? My stands for mobile <coughs> ad hoc networks. A lot of people believe that this is the holy grail of future telecommunications, and that it captures all the big challenges and problems of future telecommunication systems. Let's see that. So this is a mobile network that has a collection of radio nodes, which are, uh, which are able to transmit, receive, or relay. The main thing is that we don't need infrastructure. All the telecommunication that we know now, you need a base station, right? And you communicate through the base station. Typically, when you want to call him, even if you sit next to each other, you will take your device, the device will contact the base station, and then through the base station, it will connect him, right? So if they need the infrastructure. Here, we don't need any kind of infrastructure. And that's why it can be a standalone network. What's the difference? The nodes are mobile, which means that we have very dynamic topology. So now I will try to make you guess applications. OK. Guess. <laughs> so you can see that such kind of systems are used for emergency and rescue operations, of course, medical, <coughs> sensor networks. Major scenarios, scenarios where, where standalone ones in business required, right. and efficient connection sharing. So, everyday life. Let's not go to the medical and emergency things. You are on campus. You, we are all here. We want to communicate. Why should you reach the internet, pay for that, and then come back? Right. You can, you can have a standalone network. And if someone wants to reach. Uh, the internet, then it can do it by efficient connection sharing, right? So, practically, my, my net 
describe all the problems that we have they have. Dynamic system, you know, without uh, without any kind of infrastructure and ability to be standalone. And now we go to GSRP. What is GSRP? This is the universal software with your peripheral. This is something that we're going to show you later, we have it already. And practically, this is a way to enable uh, rapid design prototyping of flexible software framework. What it means is that this has a motherboard, which has an FPGA. I told you that it's a good way you know, to make some kind of processing, fast processing. It has, therefore, high speed signal processing. And then we can connect it to general processor devices. And of course, we have some open spec uh, plotter boards, which have all the other things that we need in order to have communication. So we have these boards, the user peripherals, and we can connect them to general processor to do everything which is of low performance. We have such kind of things, of course, that can be shared with general processor devices. And still, we have all you know the antenna things that we require to make communications, right? You will see them in a while. And of course, in order to program them in the software-defined gradual manner, we use the GMU API. These are the motherboards. Okay, I don't want to discuss a lot of things about that. We will see that later. And here is a daughter board. And you can see that for the specific daughter board, we can have operation of 2.3, 2.9 gigahertz, and 4.9, 5.8, which means that we can have different frequencies. We can do such kind of trade-offs. We have multiple antenna techniques. I will discuss in a while about that. And uh, a lot of things that we can practically build a software defined radio. So this is the hardware part, the non flexible, let's say, hardware part that in which are going to run our software defined radio, right? But still, you can see we use FPGAs and uh, on the other hand, we use general processors. So, of course, we need to face the corresponding limitations, right? But still, it's very significant because we can play with an experiment and we can design systems. So this is something that we're going to see later. So these are the user keys. Here are the motherboard box with the antenna. <coughs> and here they're connected with laptops. So this is the general processor part, and here is the other part, right? And we will see how it works. And of course, what you know can also know. What our system that we're going to see in a while <coughs> supports uh, well, it supports, it's significant because practically we support everything that it is a current trend for wireless telecommunication system. And let's go first to that. This is the orthogonal frequency division multiplex. Do you have any idea about that? Please tell me about that. Okay, we'll go a bit back. In 3G systems, you knew that we have two different technologies. Do you know that? It's CDMA. <coughs> And, uh, and the European system, right? The, G uh, the GSM. So CDMA is another technique, GSM is another thing, right? And here you have both operators. In Europe, where I come from, we have only the GSM. But now people wanted to move to the four generation system. They realized that the only technology that they could use, and they were both using that, is that. So all 4G system, systems have orthogonal frequency division model. Why? What does it do? As I told you, when you want to send a lot of information, you have overlapping spectrum, right? Which is very difficult to take the information back. But if you use clever for your transforms, then the, here is the overlapping spectrum, but it is an orthogonal way. So you can have the information to the one part without affecting the other. That's great. Which means that you can swing the spectrum and still send a lot of information with overlapping spectrum, but in a way that can be recovered. OK? Of course, this is what we send. <coughs> and we send it in time. But let's go. And here is affected by the channel, the mass market. So we have a lot of subcarriers, meaning that we split the whole bandwidth in a lot of small subcarriers. And then we can send a lot of information. And no, we can send one user can have one part of the uh, of uh, the spectrum, someone else may have something else. And this 
Basically, we can think of an example with Kira, something like that. Needs very simple receiver processing, which is very simple. So, another thing that we have is multi-pin transmit and multi receive antenna pins. So, this is uh, very significant, and of course, as we heard already before, this is uh, only one of the reasons that Professor Javakan is famous for. <laughs> so, <coughs> when we have such kind of things, the main idea is that we can transmit information and receive information from, the, uh, from different antennas. This is the corresponding equivalent channel, right? Trans uh, transition channel. The idea behind that is that when these antennas are, uh, are especially uh, in, a in a different small time quarter of uh, wavelength, these channels are independent. Why does it mean that? That if it is a bad channel, this may be a good channel. It doesn't necessarily mean that it is a bad channel, right? So if you send the same information here and here, for example, then the probability of having all the sub channels to be bad is smaller than if you had only one channel, right? Which means better performance and more robust communications. This is the one system which has to do with space-time code. The other thing is that when you have several antennas, you can even send different information per antenna, right? So at the same time, we can send more information. This is called spatial manipulation. But of course, at this antenna, you receive the information of all the other antennas, right? And all the present symbol, the same here. Here, the same here. So we need uh, more difficult processing in order to decouple all those. And this has uh, to do a lot of with uh, linear algebra and uh, optimal techniques in order to decode such kind of things. And probably you have already heard about uh, street decoding or kind of like this. Adaptive modulation encoding. I told you that we need flexibility systems that adapt to different environments. So we have different techniques here. Here is a diff uh, different signal to noise ratio, so it is different operational environments. And this is the net bit rate that we, ha we can have, megabits per second. As you can see, with the different flexible scenarios, you we can send nearly at uh, all the present environments the maximum number of allowable bits, right? So we can optimize the truth. They do. And of course, we need advanced medium access control and routing protocols. And what is that? We have a device. Let's say this one here, right? So it needs to transmit and receive at a specific time so that we have reliable information. So it doesn't have to interfere with that or the other. Right? So we need to have special algorithms in order to design such advanced minimum access control protocols. And this is some of the work that uh, our group has done. And we have came up with a lot of advanced algorithms. And the other is routing protocols. Meaning that if I want to communicate with this node here, from this to this, which is the optimal path that should follow to do that and optimize the performance of that. As you can understand, these are highly complicated problems that have to be solved on the fly. So I will not tell you about the details, but I hope that you get more or less what the future system should have, right, to operate. And this is something that we're going to see in a while that we have now. Right? So since we don't have a lot of time yet, I will try to discuss about the challenges. So practically, you already know now what the challenges are fundamental trade-off <coughs> between implementation efficiency right, and flexibility. That's why in the title of my presentation you can see that I said implementing the future. I didn't say you know, developing the future or I didn't write uh, you know, envisioning the future. Even this you know, simple task simple of implementation is huge. Limitation and processing capabilities. I told you already that when we do software-defined things, it's very difficult to achieve it. 
we are, have already discussed that we need highly complex signal processing algorithms, right? I, I showed you the complexity and how it increased. Operation over a broad set of very heterogeneous scenarios. And on the top, we have hardware imperfections, <coughs> amplifiers, antennas, all these kind of things that we're going to have in some kind of device. Current trends. This is, these are research things. This is topics, fields that people work in, and of course are good, and we produce results. Complex efficient algorithms, of course, meaning that that means complexity. I can give some trade off, and I see that I have a very complex algorithm that can give me the perfect performance in a very bad scenario. But how many times do I face this bad scenario, right? How many times I need this complexity and I'm willing to spend this energy? Efficient cross layer design. So I need to take into account a higher layer, which is the application. I have to take into account, you know, the internet, how it works. I have to take into account what are my processing capabilities. And here we come to exploitation of parallelism, which is huge. It's a huge topic for all of these things. The question is, why parallel? Why should we go parallel? Can we avoid it? As I told you already, we have limitations with uh, uh, the processing needs, and because of the physical requirements, right, below 65 nanometers. So now we have to face the truth. We cannot go that way. That. This is the one. The other thing is that parallelism can offer us in some way, OK, that I can describe now in detail, energy efficiency. So when you split something, you reduce all the clocks. And when you reduce all the clocks in your system, you know, the, the, the lighter, then you can save energy. But the issue is that how we're going to exploit this parallelism. I just, you know, a couple of months ago, I read you know, a nice high degree uh, paper that was discussing about parallelism. It's in parallelism. It, had, it was full of, uh, an office full of computers that could be working in parallel, and only one was working with a single guy. Right. So the idea is that in order to exploit parallelism, we need parallel programming. We need to be able to parallelize our system. And here, in telecoms, it's very difficult because our, uh, you know, the telecoms are not parallel. So get the information to, to, you know, to synchronize, then you need to decode, then you need to have information. So it's not parallel. So it's a huge task in order to find what is parallelizing in there. And of course, how you can make it in a processor system on chips and architectures. And for that, there's a lot of work that also takes place in efficient software tools. And this is compilers, which fit the hardware, the software, right? We would like when we had algorithms to have high level design, interfaces that link the hardware to software, and virtual platforms which allow us to check what happens before they be implemented. So, some conclusions. Future wireless and new systems will be highly complex and will enjoy flexible characteristics. Do we agree on that? Is it clear? Here I will show you something that some, okay, not yet. Maybe I've been a while. Okay. Manage our uh, rapidly deployable computer and dynamic systems that we don't need infrastructure. Software defined radio is a promising way to implement such kind of systems, right? Of course, we will not be that high, but still, we can see why, which kind of flexibility we really want, and then we have an example to optimize our system. <coughs> USRP, as I told you, is a good way in order to have managed and user peace. <coughs> there is a fundamental trade-off between flexibility and implementation efficiency. And as you saw, <coughs> the design and implementation of software defined radio is an interdisciplinary task, right? It's not about writing algorithms, techniques, or everything. We should be able to challenge, uh, to, to, uh, to find uh, solutions to all the challenges. And this is something that we all need to work together, right? With software, hardware, and everything. Yeah. And these challenges apply to all high performance flexibility in the systems. And here, I would like to show you a simple example. You have your smartphones. It's nothing more than 
a flexible software defined radius account. The different version says that say that we have the hardware, which is the kind of hardware, and we run some kind of software. And Android, for example, is a typical thing, right? It can run over everything. It cannot provide you with anything because it has to optimize all these things, right? But in some way, they do the same kind of research. So they restrict their flexibility to your needs, right, in order to be able to provide you with the best performance that they can. So there is the same kind of trade-off, right? And if you would like to generalize it, then you will go to these money systems. Here. So, questions? Thank you very much.